I'm so he's a one-man army. I mean, he knows what jizya is. So when I say jizya, I'm going to try to introduce it according to Islamic sources. Allahu Akbar. Jihad al-Talab is that you are to ask the Kuffar until you open the land of the Kuffar and open them to Islam. And if they come to Islam, they come to the jizya. And if they come to the jizya, they come to the jizya. So I have a Quran 929 in front of me here. Two translations, just to make sure that people see that it's basically saying the same thing. So the first thing it's saying here, uh, according to the Noble Quran, Hilali and Khan translation, it's saying the following, you fight those who do not believe in Allah. The first thing that you see here is you fight them based on their disbelief. Surah 9 verse 29. So when you read a verse like this, according to David, which teaches to, to fight against disbelievers, well, Islam looks aggressive, Islam looks violent. Now, you know, I actually looked up that verse. And I'd like to read for it to you. And let me tell you what it really says here. Um, it says, and fight those who believe. Fight those who believe not in Allah in the last day. <laughs> hold on a second. Hold on a second. This must be some mistake here. I think this is just a typo, I think. Let, let, let me check it out. I actually have a Quran. Let me check it up on my Quran. This, this is obviously a typo. We're going to get down to the bottom of this. All right. David, it doesn't say that. It says, it says fight those who believe. Fight those who believe not in Allah in the last day. Hmm. Well, can we change the topic to what we all have in common? No! That's actually a much better topic, don't you think? I mean, actually, uh, because we do have a lot in common. Um, with the moderator, would that be okay? We could just change that topic? No. And then it continues and says, you fight those who do not believe in the last days. That's those who are not religious or agnostic. And the third type of people you fight are basically those who do not submit to Islamic law. And they have a fourth type, which are the people of the book who reject Islam and they call Jews, Christians. It is also Sabians and Zoroastrians. And you fight them until they pay money. Jizya is it's basically like a tax, but it's more than just money. You got to make sure that they feel subdued. That is very important. Next slide. But some people ask, like, how much tax is it? Even sometimes you'll hear Muslims say, hey, non-Muslims, they pay less tax than us. So it's quite fair. Uh, it's not really that clear. Scholar says that, you know, it should be a certain amount of gold. Uh, it's not really clear how much you should pay. But according to this hadith here, you see that the Jews has to pay half of their fruits. So I'll just read this one. So Allah's messenger intended to expel the Jews, but they requested him to let them stay there on the condition that they would do the labor and get half of the fruit. Before I go on and tell you what Jesus is, it's not just money. Remember that. You have to make sure that they feel subdued. You'll see a Muslim here who says that Jizya is so beautiful. He'll present the Disney version of what Jizya is. He said, America should impose Jizya on Muslims. I do want you to see this. And Jizya is taken from non-Muslims. Allah said in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, Surah number 9, Ayat number 29, that fight those who do not believe in Allah and last day till they humble themselves and if they do not revert to Islam, collect jizya from them. The non-Muslims, unfortunately, they misquote this ayat, misrepresent this ayat as a very barbaric law from the Muslim community or the Sharia over the non-Muslims. I request the non-Muslim governments today to implement upon the Muslim country, Muslim communities in the region the concept of jizya for us. And you see how different it is. All right. In so that, if we would take what he says seriously, then we got to implement Jizya according to what Muhammad said, not your Disney version. So let's find out what Jizya is according to Islam. So those who are paying Jizya, they are called dhimis. So it's a status in society where you are, Muslim love to say that you're a protected person. The original status of the Kafir for the Muslim, as Rasulullah said, he said the life, the wealth and the property of the Kuffar, it has no sanctity, meaning I can take him out whenever I, I, I feel to, unless he has aqd al amana, a covenant of security, a treaty. Those who are offered to pay the jizya are Jews, Christians, Zoroastrians, and Sabians. The rest just get Islam or the sword, which includes atheists, agnostics, and so on. What we have seen in history is that they have made an exception for Sikhs and Hindus. But Hindus especially believe in many god. They are called polytheists. Normally, they only have two options, Islam or the sword. But we have seen through history that they have had the option. But that's un-Islamic. And that is probably because of financial reasons. They would rather have people pay money instead of converting to Islam. 
So if you only think that this is part of history, you're dead wrong. So here you have the Taliban's asking the non-Muslims to wear a badge to identify them as a non-Muslims. And if they are identified as non-Muslims, then anyone on the street can push them, spit on them, mistreat them. They're easy to spot. So harassing people and mistreating them on the street based on their, their disbelief is part of Islamic way. So as you can see here in this report, you can see that Muhammad said that whoever you meet on the streets, the Jews or Christians, then you push them to the narrowest portion. You force them basically, you mistreat them. And if you go further down in this report, you see that Muslims are ordered to humiliate them. Do I need to say anything more? Evil. And here's another article where you can see that the Hindus are asked by the Taliban's um, to put on uh, basically uh, a sign on your clothes that you are a non-Muslim. This is from 2001, so it's modern history. How evil isn't this cult? Uh, the claim that they are protected, who are they protected from? So if you would compare that to the mafia coming to your restaurant, right? And they say, basically, you pay us this money and we will protect you. And the question is, hey, who are you protecting us from? Well, if you don't pay it, but we're going to kill you. So it's extortion money. And we merchants have found... You really should have some round-the-clock security here. Isn't that what the police are for? They do their best, but they got their hands full. Your weekly dues to us will give you all the supplemental safety net you'll ever need. I can't authorize anything like that. It'd have to go through corporate in Seattle. We merchants prefer to deal on a personal, one-on-one -on -one basis. I don't have any discretionary funds. It's got to go through corporate. What if an employee, even the manager, say, was assaulted? Islam is peace. If you would compare this to other societies, if you go back to 1994, I think, in South Africa, you had apartheid, where you had different rules for different people. So I just have one pamphlet. It should be from that time, where you had, for example, here, no African may buy land and own property anywhere in the Republic. So here you see you have different rules for different people based on different categories. That is jizya for you guys. Let's continue. What is the purpose of jizya according to Islamic scripture? Well, I'm going to show you here what I found. So according to Quran 929, it says here, you fight them until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel them as subdued. So submission is very important. Another hadith here you see, according to Muat Malik, zakat is a tax for Muslims, is imposed on the Muslim to purify them and to be given back to the poor. And by the way, it's only poor that are Muslims. And I have other hadiths if you guys want to see this. But let's continue. Whether well, Jesus is imposed on the people of the book to humble them. The dhimmi, from time to time, you should slap him on the back of the head. Just to remind him that he's the dhimmi and he's the kafir. Another passage here, it's Quran 57.25. It's a tafsir by Ibn Kathir. You see the following what Muhammad is saying here. The Messenger of Allah said, remember, we are looking for the purpose of jizya. The Messenger of Allah said, I was sent with the sword before the hour basically before the judgment day so that Allah will be worshipped alone without partners. My provision was placed under the shadow of the spear and those who defy it, basically those who don't want to be Muslims or are Muslims and are basically Coca-Cola light Muslims. For example, open Bukhari, you would find the hadith that if you find the Jew or a Christian walking down the street, push them to the side. It is well known from what Umar ibn al-Khattab and the Khulafa al-Rashidin used to implement that the Jew and Christian was not allowed to ride on a horse when the Muslim is riding on the horse. They will have to walk. Allah, he said in the Quran about the jizya, that you that fight the people of the book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, it's in the Quran, fight the people of the book and those who do not believe that what Allah has made lawful as lawful and what Allah has made unlawful as lawful until they pay the jizya and feel themselves subdued. The purpose of the jizya is to make the Jew and the Christian know that they are inferior and subjugated to Islam. Okay? In the Muslim state, although the Jew and Christian is free to practice their religion, this is allowed, but they cannot display their cross. And even in the time of Umar, they were not allowed to reconstruct or construct new churches. All of this is to create an atmosphere where the, it is encouraging the people to come to Iman and Islam. <laughs> Yeah, I like right, So as you heard, all of this is to create a climate for people to say, hey, this is not worth it. All right. So um, let's now find out what Muhammad himself said. 
like instead of saying forcing them, he say encourage them. Yes, yeah. So <laughs> this new Islamic newspeak. Yeah. So I'm going to show a couple of examples from Muhammad that it, it's not just you know evil people doing it you know through history. Every time that you see Muslim behaving in a certain way, you got to match it with Islamic scripture. If it's not in line with that, then they acting on their own desires. But when they're acting according to scripture, um, that's very Islamic. So in Tirmidhi 3, volume 3, book 19, Hadith 1602, Muhammad is saying the following. The Messenger of Allah said, do not precede the Jews and Christians with a salam. Salam is another word for say, hello, peace be upon you. So don't say that. But and if you meet them in the path, basically on the road, you got to force them to the narrow portion. You got to push them. And then it continues saying the following. The Muslims are ordered to humiliate them. And this one is a sahih. He said, when they walk down the alleyways, you should make it narrow for them. And when they walk, they have to walk on the same side of the road as the animals. Another example, Sahih Muslim, 1942-94. Fight in the name of Allah, and fight those who disbelieve in Allah, and make a holy war. And if you just go down in the hadith, say the following. Here's a step how to do it. First, you invite them to accept Islam. And before I continue here, you got to know that the first generation Muslims, they went from Saudi Arabia, Mecca, Medina, up to... Uh, Syria, they invaded Syria, they invaded Iraq, Jerusalem, Lebanon, Egypt, Libya, Morocco, Spain was a little later, it was around 50 years later. They went to Iran, Afghanistan, this is the first generation Muslims, you know. So this is how they spread the faith. They took the sword and says, either you do the following here. So you invite them to accept Islam, first point. If they respond to that, then you accept it from them and you desist from fighting them. Point number two, if they refuse to accept Islam, you demand from them jizya. So here you're saying to them, like the mafia are saying to restaurant owner, hey, you join us, or you, we take money from you, or we're going to kill you. And here comes the third step. If they refuse to pay the tax, then seek Allah's help and fight them. And this Sahih Muslim, as you see the source. Islam, jizya, fasta'am billahi wa qatilhum. Bidun ma yqatluk, qatilhum. Fasta'am billahi wa qatilhum. Fal yasma'ha al-ulama, fasta'am billahi wa qatilhum. Masha? عندما يقاتلونك لا عندما يرفضون تطبيق عندما يرفضون دخول الإسلام ويرف أو ويرفضون دخول تطبيق دفع الجزية. Another example from Muhammad: Do not even eat with them. He's talking about disbelievers. Abu Sa'id narrated that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said, "Do not accompany except with the believers. So do not engage with them unless they are Muslims, and do not serve your food and accept." Uh, to one with taqwa and taqwa is piety basically you try to spread islam and talk about allah so that's one way of proselytizing and this one is sahih here's another one this one is hassan the prophet says associate only with the believers and let only god-fearing man eat your meals humiliate the kafir what do you mean humiliate the kafir like i said you never look up to him you always look down to him you, you look down to him like that hello can i help you down there Al-Islam is superior and it could never be surpassed because the Tawheed, it will always elevate you. Yeah, and this is why Al-Farooq, he said, Nahnu Qawban, Nahnu Qawban, Allah wal Islam. He said, we are a Qawb who Allah, he dignified us with Islam. That's why you always walk with your head up high. Not with Taqabbar, with arrogance. Yeah, yeah, I'm like this. No, but this type of Taqabbar is allowed to be proud that you are Muslim. Yes, I worship Allah the highest. <laughs> Look at you. He worshiped the ants. <laughs> he's worshiping the rats. Uh, rats. Uh, this one, he worships his private parts. This one, uh, yeah, he's a, he's a monkey worshiper, cow worshiper. Oh, he's having a shower, you know, with, underneath the underneath uh, Hogubugu, whatever his name is, or <laughs> some stupid animal like that. Nahnu Qawman, he said. Nahnu Qawman. We are Qawman who Allah dignified us via Islam. And the Kufr, it would humiliate anybody. So to dishonor. So never give your food to any kafir. I never give my food to any kafir. That's right. I had some takards, they will come to work for me a couple of months ago. They're going to be coming, some new ones are coming now to work for me soon. We're going to pick them up for about 20 quid a day. Yeah, they came to work for me and they were in the garden. I don't offer none of my food. I sat there in my kitchen, I was eating my chandi masala and my rice masala. You get the point, right? So you got to make sure you humiliate them. But also in the eye of the law, it says the following here. If a Muslim do a crime against non-Muslim, they will not have the same punishment as if a non-Muslim does it to a Muslim. And here is an example here. The judgment that no Muslim should be killed for, I mean, equality in punishment, for killing a kafir, non-Muslim. It's apartheid, basically, uh, based on their disbelief. Here's another one by Abu Dawood saying that the value for blood money, blood money is if you kill someone, then the, the, the victim family has the opportunity to say, here, either we get money for you uh, for killing our family members or you're going to have the equal punishment. So the punishment or the blood money for uh, killing disbelievers 
can re read a last sentence. It's only half for a, as, a, as for a Muslim. So it's not equal in the eye of the law. You don't have the same rights and the same punishments. And here's another part of jizya that you need to know. Disbelievers have to make sure that they have one way to show to the Muslim that they are not Muslims. One way to do that is to wear belt. And that belt is to show the Muslim that, hey, he's not one of us. We can degrade him and we can make sure that we can mistreat him. And that reminds me of something else in history, in modern history, actually. Around 70 years ago, we had Hitler who made sure that the Jews had certain symbols on the clothes to make sure that, that they could recognize them. Uh, so this belt is called Zunar, for those who have never heard this. Zunar. And you'll find this in Quran 929, you go Tafsir Ibn Kathir, who will explain this. In Quran 929. So Umar ibn Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, demanded his well-known condition met by the Christians. It's not just Christians, it's everybody who's paid the jizya. That these conditions be, should be ensured to continue the humiliation. So the, the, the goal is to humiliate people. So I'm not going to read all of them. I think it's like 15 points. I'm going to read the relevant part. The first thing is that the disbelievers um, should not erect any monastery, church, sanctuary for mosque, or any place of, of worship. So remember that the Muslim in my previous slide says that, hey, I request the non-Muslim governments today to implement upon the Muslim country, Muslim communities in the region, the concept of jizya for us. And you see how different it is. Next one is, a Muslim can come to your house. I'll just read the, the, the relevant part. Those Muslim who come as a guest will enjoy boarding and food for three days. So you have to open your house for three days. Any Muslim can come to your house and claim food and shelter for three days. What you can do, you can go to the church, knock on the door, John, let me in. Okay, no problem. He, John has to put up uh, uh, Abdul Ghafoor for the night. Abdul Ghafoor with his big belly, having his nice kebab. John has to open up the church and he has to go there and sleep there nice and comfortable and say, all right, John, thank you. And then carry on going <laughs> early in the morning. Which wife is gonna live with John under that type of circumstances? What kind of dishonor, honoring is this for me to live with John and Abdul Ghafoor comes every Friday night? And, and sleeps in our bed as well, of course. Because sunnah is to look after the guest, isn't it? I can't make you sleep on my floor if you can. You're Muslim, by the way. So what about when Abdul Ghafoor goes to John's house? John, sleep on the floor, and I'll sleep, I'll sleep, I'll, I'll sleep uh, uh, on the bed. What's gonna happen? Tracy's gonna be on the floor thinking, my husband, he's got a forehead shaved, and this one, look at this one, Qatab, mashallah. Which one's more attractive? We're not gay, but I'm just saying. Next point. Number five, we respect Muslims and you got to move from your places where you sit in if they choose to sit in them. So basically, a non-Muslim have to stand up, give away his seat to a Muslim. And number eight, you have to make sure that you are identified. I told you about the belt, but it's even more than that. Here it is. We will have the front of our hair cut. So you got to cut the front of your hair to make sure that you look in a way that it is, it is degrading, but also other people should recognize you. And you have to wear customary clothes where we are. You got to wear the belts around your waist. That is the zuna I told you about. The clothing that they wear is different from the Muslims. We wear the best kameez, the best atar. He wears like a red head headband or like a string around his waist to distinguish him himself. Al Farooq, he said the, the kafir, he needs to have his forehead shaved and the rest of his head, you know, it, it remains, the rest of his hair, it remains intact. The Muslim, he rides the horse like this. The kafir, he can't ride that. The kafir, he has to ride the donkey sideways like that, like the woman, you see? So this is like a form of peer pressure, in a way, for him to conform to the Islamic way of life. Because his son will come to him and says, Daddy, why do the Muslims walk like, like this? Why do you have to walk like this, like humble, like that? Why do the Muslims ride a horse like that? Why do you ride like that? Daddy, why you got a string around your neck? Daddy, why you got your forehead shaved? Either the father will become Muslim, or the son will become Muslim, or they both become Muslim. The last point here is, you'll see jizya being implemented today here. I mean, I'll show it when ISIS did it. I think that's, that's fine. Okay. So this is from 2014. ISIS are just being loyal to the text. This BBC, this is as mainstream as you can get. And here yeah, is the relevant part. Actually. <laughs> Sorry? They're quite left-wing in this country, so they're quite yeah, yeah, yeah. So they talk about the churches not allowed to, to be renovated and so on. But let's go to the relevant part. So the statement said that the group had to meet Christian representative and offer them three choices, just like Muhammad said. And they have to convert to Islam, accept ISIS condition, basically jizya and live humiliating life that, or reject that and risk to being killed. Yeah, so this is what you're having. So this is in Iraq and Syria.
in Raqqa, a city entirely under the control of the Islamic State. هل تفي هذه الأحكام بالمعايير الدولية المتفق عليها؟ طبعاً لا أكيد إن كان هم من الأول ورضى الله عز وجل وتحكيم شرع الله لا يهم من المعايير الدولية قال عن من قاضي الأحوال الشخصية لا قوم قاضي معاملة قال عن قاضي شؤون أهل الزمة قاضي شؤون أهل الزمة للمسارة المنطقة Christians, according to this senior figure, are entitled to live safely within the Islamic State, with certain provisions. في سنة 1435 في الثاني والعشرين من ربيع الأول كان هناك عهد ذمة أذن به الخليفة البغدادي حفظه الله فجاء النصارى يطلبون هذا العهد ويطلبون هذا العقد واجتمعنا معهم وكان ممثلا هناك يحضر. عن الخليفة البغدادي وإذا بهم قال نعرض عليكم الإسلام فإن لم تقبلوا فإننا نعرض عليكم الجزية التي أمر بها القرآن فإن لم تقبلوا فليس بيننا وبينكم إلا القتل والقتال وإذا بهم يقولون نريد الجزية والله ما آذيناهم والله ما هجرناهم In spite of this agreement most Christians have fled the city of Raqqa. When IS fighters took Mosul in neighboring Iraq, approximately 30,000 Christians fled and their churches were destroyed. But it's not just Christians who have to worry. The mosques of Shiite Muslims have also been a target of IS. الشيطان نزل بكل جنوده ما كانش عمل في الكنيسة اللي عملوا الإخوان المسلمين نهب تخريب الكنيسة كانت تحفة فنية فاخرة This is happening in Egypt, it's happening in Iraq, it's happening in Syria, it's happening in Lebanon, it's happening in all other uh, countries in the Middle East And I had another slide here showing this happening in Egypt. Muslims in southern Egypt killed two Christian men for failing to pay them protection money. As CBN News reported earlier, Muslims in the area are demanding that Christians pay them jizya. That's a kind of tax that Islamic law requires religious minorities to pay Muslims. But the tax is so high, many Christians simply can't afford it. The Voice of the Martyrs reports that a Muslim man demanded a Christian in a village in Asuit pay him nearly $1,500. The Christian sought help from local police, but to no avail. When he failed to come up with the money, several Muslims went to his home and shot him and his cousin to death. Pakistan. The cousin of Yashpal, who was one of the Sikh beheaded in Pakistan, claimed that the situation has become very dangerous for the Sikh community in Pakistan, adding that the Taliban keep demanding ransom, and as a result, their business is also suffering. 
And even here, you see the Thomas Jefferson, the founders of America, they had to pay GZ as well. Yeah, that's all I had. Excellent. Thank you so much. Was this the Thomas Jefferson? Was that when they were being attacked at Jefferson's time? I mean, I've heard that story where uh, they were being attacked. And Jefferson asked them, why are you attacking us? Is that yeah, can, I can I show the letter? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so this is the letter from um, Thomas Jefferson had an ambassador who were talking to, I think it was Mor Moroccan or Algerian people, and they were like, why are you attacking us? So yeah. this is the official government webpage of America. Yes, um, make it a bit bigger if you can so we can see it. Here. Yeah. And you can just read a little bit of that. So this is from 1786. You'll see that this is not a new phenomenon. So he's getting a letter from the ambassador of Algeria, Morocco. So this is ambassador of, of America, writing to the president of, of America. And that's Jefferson. So Ambassador answered us that it was found in the laws of their prophet that it's written in the Quran that all nations who should not acknowledge their authority were sinners. And that was in their right and duty to make war upon them wherever they could be found and to make them slaves of all they could take as prisoners and that every Muslim man, these Muslims, should be slain in the battle were sure to go to paradise. Yes, that's that's exactly the example. I think that was Hitchens who originally gave that. That's where I originally heard it from as well. And obviously he was quoting this back yeah. in Jefferson's time, you know, where the boats were being attacked and so forth, their, their merchant ships. And this was the response. Um, yeah. uh, is it true then? Because Hitchens, if I remember correctly, Hitchens basically said, well, then Jefferson, you know, went in with some force there to get rid of these guys. I don't know whether that's... That was the first battle. That's the first Navy. When... Yeah, that was the first battle that the U.S. ever fought was against Muslims. Ah, oh, okay. Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's the first Navy. So it, it, it's not a new phenomenon. Dig Dig